Center Point Church, good morning. It's good to be here with you. Um, uh, first, I just want to thank you for having us and, and partnering with us uh, in our mission to Native America. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But let me finish my thanks. Thanks, David, for inviting me here to preach. It is a fearful thing to preach, as you know. Um, but I do it. If I was um, something like Calvin, not of his caliber, but I prefer to be locked away in an office just studying and writing sermons and then giving them away to people, but to be in front of folks. Um, and, but unfortunately, I, I probably fear people more than the Lord, but, um, but uh, we're here today, and it, it actually is a, it's a fearful delight to bring God's word to you this morning. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to tell you what we do. Patrick Regina Lennox, we serve with Mission to the World, your favorite missions agency. And, um, and we've been serving with them for uh, 10 years full time. Um, and prior to that, it was eight years. We took advantage of their short term missions programs in the summertime. And we went to the Cherokee, um, uh, Cherokee folks in North Carolina, Eastern Band of the Cherokees. Um, and we uh, did all those standard, typical short term things, VBS in the, in the neighborhoods and painted someone's porch and all that kind of stuff. All those fun things to just to meet the people and op have opportunities for, to give the gospel. So we did that for eight years, eight summers. We went back and forth continually. So, and then we finally got to the point we said, we need to keep doing this. We can't stop. Tell you, the, tell you the truth, if you want to know what a burden is, I knew when I drove onto the reservation, I did not want to go home. That simple. That was back in 2006. But I just started seminary, just started a full-time gig at my church. We were there for 10 years. Um, but here we are talking about it. So what we do now is, uh, let me just tell you what the field is all about. There are 574 federally recognized tribes in this country. There are another 634, right? Am my number straight? Up in Canada. So that's over 1,200 tribes, tribal people, that MTW and other mission agencies will not be able to raise enough to go to each. And it's not even necessary to go to all of them. That's, that's something also to recognize, that the Lord has been at this long before MTW existed. There's been missionaries, David Brainerd, he's been kicking around the woods here when there used to be woods around here. And, and he, he met a lot of the native folk back in those days. Um, but the Lord's been at work in Native America, and, but the work is not done. Uh, we have, uh, as far as 1899, there were less than 250,000 Native American people in this country less than 250,000. Now the number is in the millions. Those who did the last census identify themselves as native, over seven million. Those who are considered full bloods are close to three million. Those who are tribal affiliated are less than that. But the point is there are millions of native folk in this country and in Canada and up in Alaska as well. Um, and there are churches that are there by God's grace. Um, the Great Commission has been going and continuing, but there's a serious, serious lack of trained leaders throughout Native America. And that's really throughout the world, um, but in Native America, the, the, the field that we love the most and most affiliated with, associated with, we see there's such a lack of uh, leadership. A lot of Native pastors have little to no formal training. I always wanna paint a clear picture. I know PhDs, MDiv guys, Dean Mins in Native America for sure. But the majority of the folks that we bump into in churches that we visit have a pastor there, might be by default. Maybe the old pastor died and someone was the music director and said, hey, you're the pastor now. There's your ordination service right there. It happens. Um, we see a need. Uh, we've been told we see the need, but we've been told about the need with our native leader friends as well. They see the same exact need. And so what we try to do with Oka Ministries, and we have a separate ministry called, a uh, separate 501c called Oka Ministries, and Regina has brochures. So just take our propaganda materials, and I'm sure there's some real estate left in your fridge for our car. You can do, read about that. We get some websites you can look at. But we're about discipleship and leadership training and education. I needed help to get my seminary degree. I needed help to even get to Bible college. Uh, I needed help. I needed a good kick in the pants, and I needed some great encouragement to make it happen. And so I, I felt it myself, and the folks that we know, they need it as well. So we're, we're about raising up leaders in, in throughout Native America. And so we don't, we're not tribe specific. We do a lot of traveling. We gather folks together. Lord willing, we're going to have a discipleship center in North Carolina. Uh, you're all invited to come and help build it up. And, um, but we're still waiting on that. I don't give too many details because that'll swap all of my time because I can talk a lot about that. Mm -hmm. 
But um, I, I would say that this, it's a threefold ministry symbol. Native pastors gathering, it's a yearly retreat. It's going to be every other year at this point until we have a, a staff to handle more of the details. Right now it's just this is the team. And it's tough to do all the things we want to do with just the two of us. Uh, we get some great f friends who help out as well, just to be fair. And also our, our Oakham Discovery Center, which would be our headquarters for basic discipleship, and then Oakham Institute, which would be a step towards seminary, if not Lord willing, one day a seminary. Um, so that's our threefold ministry. There's so much more we want to do, but uh, we do have a, a, a board of directors now who told me, Patrick, that's what we're doing, those three, leave it there, don't do any more until we get established. Um, but I was just told that, you, you know, you, you can't outdream the Lord, you can't think bigger than the Lord, so I just say, let's go for it. Uh, but we still have constraints of time and space constraints that, you know, so, and resources. So Oka Ministries, just write the check and we'll take it. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so just take our stuff and uh, learn more about us, and we are uh, thankful that you are partnering with us. And um, so the outreach, I, I'm not sure if you have other missionaries who go to Native America from here, but um, if not, then we're the ones. Pray for us, and I pray for the wonderful, rich mission field that's out there, and the best years, uh, the greatest chapter in missions history is still yet to come. There's so much more to do. It's not over, all right? The best year is not behind us. So, all right. Oh, the timer? Yeah. What time do I have to? Awesome. <laughs> there you go. I don't know. I'll, when her foot starts tapping a lot, then I know I'm, I'm getting... To... <laughs> uh, yes, that's how we do it. Um, this is one more thing that's going to fall off. Let me get rid of that. All right, we are in we are in Psalm two, and I've just been I've been in Psalm two for the last couple of years. So we have like five sermons to go through today. Um, is it your tradition to stand for the reading of God's word? Let's do it right now. Let's just do it right now. From the word of God. Why do the nations rage? and the people's plot in vain. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell the decree, the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. All right, you may be seated. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for this day you've given us. This is your day. They're all your days, but Father, you set this day aside that we would come together as your church to worship you and to glorify and lift high the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. And we ask by the power of the Holy Spirit you would illumine your word to us, open our hearts and minds to receive what's here and what was already prayed. Uh, protect this preacher from the wiles of the devil. Let me speak the truth and your, and your truth only, the only truth. And I give this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, I've been, um, I've been looking at this uh, more and more uh, these last few years. If we are living in tumultuous times, by the way, get your seatbelt on. Granted, we live in a fallen world, and there are millions upon millions of people who have only known tumult and uncertainty throughout history up to this very day. Relatively speaking, many of us here have enjoyed a certain amount of comfort and security compared to others throughout world history. Yes, but globally speaking, we have some real change happening, and it's affecting everybody. 
It would be easy to say that the world has always had problems. No need to be alarmist, of course. True enough, but unlike other times in world history, we live in a much smaller, interconnected world where communication travels at light speed, which is often a good thing, but also where lies and fact-checked propaganda make the headlines of mainstream and social media outlets and government websites, and where truth is suppressed, as we've seen uh, recently come out with our Congress. And the outspoken truth seekers are glibly deemed conspiracy theorists. We've endured a pandemic with mysterious, quote unquote, mysterious origins. We have been enduring relentless and oppressive, oppressive government responses, which are proving to be more and more dangerous than the virus itself. And yes, the studies are conclusive. The reports are coming in. The world excess death statistics are up in the last three years, which are not attributed to COVID. Excess deaths, as they are labeled, according to experts, are those deaths which exceed the predictable deaths in the world every year. I won't give my theories, but it may leak. But I don't remember so many young, healthy people collapsing and dying on TV and during sports games, whether they're athletes and news anchor people and musicians, etc. Right now in world history, we're living in a perfect storm of factors that are sure to spark a global reset of some kind, for better or for worse. Change is coming, and in fact, it is happening now. Aside from our financial woes, we're witnessing perversions of every kind, which are gaining mainstream acceptance more and more. Parents are openly and gleefully bringing their children to drag shows. The main line, now liberal churches have fully embraced the trans community and have invited so-called drag queens to parade themselves in the church. Have you seen that yet? There are really people in this world who are truly confused about what gender they are, believing not only more than two, but upwards of 50 or more, and even that number is probably outdated by now. Life is cheap by millions. By the millions, children are killed in the womb. People are bought, sold, abused, recorded, and killed in human trafficking in the underworld. I say underworld, but it reaches the highest levels of society. Lawlessness is tolerated and even promoted in the US cities. Technological advancements are exceeding our capability to keep up with the changes. Too much data to process with no reflection and wisdom, just quote unquote facts, but no truth. We are held captive by digital distractions of every imaginable kind. Elon Musk, you must have heard him by now, and others are telling us the day is coming when humans will no longer be needed to work, that bots, drones, computers, and yes, AI will do everything that humans need to do. There's a lab in Germany of just last year that boasts of artificial wombs, yes, baby factories. People are sharply divided and fragmented maybe in your own neighborhood or workplace. The nuclear family as prescribed by the scriptures and as well as recognized in natural revelation is assaulted from every angle. Children have two daddies, mommies may choose to be identified as him or her, and they're now called birthing parents. Even the word parent is being uh, discouraged, if not outlawed in certain circles. Social engineers want you to stop eating food that comes from the land. The cult of veganism and globalists want you to stop eating meat. Great efforts are right now being made to shut down family farms and meat producers. We just met a couple last week who are feeling it. Remember, Paul warned us about the doctrine of demons, is what he says, the doctrine of demons in, in 1 Timothy 4.4. 4. Those who forbid marriage or in the eating of food that God created to be received with thanksgiving. Social engineers and environmentalists tell us that climate change will kill us all. FYI, little biographical sketch here, I can tell you as a former godless environmentalist myself, saving the planet and saving the world's population are not the same things. They start with the premise that there are too many people on the planet, about seven and a half billion too many. Never forget, it was just a few years ago when it was called global warming, then it was, then there was a prediction of the ice age in the 1970s, too cold, too hot, can't decide. Just call it change, but half the people you know now believe that the sky is falling and, the, and we're about to die. The whole world is going to collapse, as if that were a bad idea in the minds of some of these globalists. 
The idea of a cashless society is here and making headway. Transactions will be monitored and ultimately reflected in your social credit score. Just saw a headline just the, um, yesterday how IRS has been called out for using AI to peek into people's bank accounts. It's happening now. Oh, what a doomsday sayer I am. All this and then some of the rotten, all this and then some, sorry, is the rotten fruit of the so-called worldview called postmodernism, which tells us there is no such thing as truth. There is no grand narrative, as we see clearly in the scripture. There is no God, therefore we're not made in his image. Postmodernism is actually an anti-worldview, just another of the devil's tools to corrode any notion of truth, meaning, and especially the idea of a sovereign God who rules the universe, thus creating the perfect environment to all these things to take place, right here, right now. Now, I can go on, but my point in mentioning all this is to show we are ever closer to George Orwell's 1984 or any dystopian movie and book that you've ever read. It's actually, it's a big mashup of, all, of them all. We're living in it right now. Maybe the aesthetics don't match from the movies, so it doesn't look like it, it doesn't seem like it, but the core issue is the same. The goal is the same, to dehumanize and control the masses. Our problem is we don't believe it. We think it's a theoretical possibility in the distant future, but technology has caught up with the godless rulers who have the insatiable desire to reduce the masses and control the rest. And don't forget what God said right before he destroyed the Tower of Babel, Genesis 11:6. six. I'll read it here. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have one language, and this is the only beginning of what they will do. And here's the key from the Lord's mouth. And nothing they propose to do will now be impossible for them. If it's science fiction, if they can think of it, we're here now. All kinds of evil machinations are unfolding before our eyes. We, love, we live somewhere on the timeline between the Tower of Babel and the New Jerusalem. I don't know where we are on the timeline, but hopefully we can draw strength, confidence, wisdom, and endurance from our text this morning. So let's get into it. Um, some introductory remarks about our, our psalm here. Psalm 2 um, has been thought to be uh, the rest of Psalm 1. It's, um, some believed it was actually just one long psalm. It's, and the books that we are reading right now are divided, at, the, the Psalms are basically five books they're considered. So 1 through 41 are Davidic Psalms, and, and um, in Psalms 1 and 2, although your Bible just may not say of David, we do know Peter later on in the book of Acts does say, and David said, concerning. So we do know that it is David, a king himself. So it's proposed that there are one psalm, and if you can just, thematically speaking, you can just, you can just see that. You see blessedness, themes of blessedness, and then judgment. Um, blessedness opens and closes the pair, the book ends. And using stark comparison, Psalm 1 shows the difference between the righteous and the wicked in this life and the one to come, with only one explicit mention of the Lord as his recognition of the righteous in verse 6 of Psalm 1. Psalm 2, the sequel picks up with the theme of judgment already mentioned in Psalm 1, yet now we see a fuller description of the Lord's personal dealings with the judgment of the wicked. As in, verse, as in Psalm 1, 6, the Lord is Yahweh, but now we're introduced to the Son who will carry out that judgment personally. So for our purposes this morning, I'll be dividing the Psalm into four parts. Uh, this is the question, verses 1 through 3. The answer, which is 4 through 6, but really does extend to, to the end of the chapter. Um, verses 7 and 9 is the decree, and then there's the warning, 10 through 12, capped off with a blessing. So let's get into it. Why do the nations rage, rage and people's plot in vain? Who are these nations, these people, these kings, these rulers? And when and where was this great council that assembled together at some point in the past to try to overtake the Lord and his anointed? For sure, the very first rebellion took place in the garden. The first ruler, or technically speaking, his wife, took counsel from the serpent. Eve then convinced her husband to follow suit. From that moment on, the rebellion continued into this very day. The earliest organized global restructuring 
took place after the flood, which was a judgment against the wicked on the earth. And since water doesn't wash away sin, the nations were hell-bent on continuing their rebellion against their maker. Hence, we have the account of the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. What was the Tower of Babel? It was the monument to human achievement without the Lord. It was to be a symbol of heaven on earth, a united people living in harmony, speaking the same language, everyone's on the same page, reading from the same script, everyone walking and quacking in the same direction. The city of man, utopia. It was the starter kit to globalism. The template. But the Lord had an answer for the citizens of Babel. He destroyed the tower, confused their language, and spread them all over the globe. But the impulse remains. World history is replete with kings, conquerors, regimes, regimes who attempt to organize societies without the Lord. The Bible gives us plenty of examples of rulers who have had no regard for Yahweh. Remember Pharaoh, who knew not Joseph. Remember the hall of shame of all the ungodly kings of Israel. Remember the Herods, Herod the Great, who tried to assassinate young Jesus, or Herod Antipas, who mocked Jesus, or Herod Agrippa I and II, and then the Caesars. In more recent times, in the 20th century, we have the 20th century has given us some ungodly and ruthless tyrannical dictators, those who are true fascists, like Hitler and Mussolini. We saw the rise of communism by the Soviet Union. We, we can argue about the distinctions between communism and socialism all day long, but in the end, people lose their property. They are taxed to death and starved to death. Their freedoms are taken away down to the minutia. Their voices are silenced, thoughts monitored, and especially the churches and home Bible studies are shut down all in the name of progress towards utopia. Satan has a war on mankind in general. He's been trying to thwart the original cultural mandate given to Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply, to exercise dominion over all the earth. God wanted his image bearers to fill the earth and worship their creator. Then the temptation of fall. But God promised the seat a seed of the woman to crush the serpent's head. And that seed of the woman is Jesus Christ. But not, not only does Satan hate people in general, he hates Christians in particular. He hates the true church of Jesus Christ, all those who are redeemed by Christ, those who are living testimonies of his sovereign grace, of his resurrection power to bring life back from the dead and his unrelenting love for his people. And not only does Satan hate us, but all those under his power, they do too. But our conquering king reminds us that the world will hate us because they hated him first, John 15, 18. That is why the kings, dictators, fascists, Muslim kingdoms, socialist, communist, utopian regimes throughout world history try to get rid of the church. They're trying to overthrow the kingdom of God. They can't stand the fact that there are people in their societies who remind them that their days are numbered and that they will be called into account. That there will be a reckoning, and there will be a reckoning. They can't live with the idea that those, there are those who will not bow their knee to the state and say, Kaiser Curios, Caesar is Lord, but rather, Yesu Curios, Jesus is Lord. The globalists of our day, who are nothing more than communists today, they, they shake it up. They change their format. The globalists of our day, WEF, perhaps you've heard of such people, want full control, yes, control over every inch of your life, including your mind, should you be so blessed to live in their utopian society. And I need not rehearse all that I said earlier in the beginning here, but you know that they must rid the world of the Church of Jesus Christ. To them, we are just a bunch of backward, superstitious, polluting parasites taking up too much space in this ever-shrinking world. Did you know the 20th century just passed was the bloody century regarding Christian martyrdom in all parts of the world? It's not coincidental that communism killed over 100 million people in the 20th century. 
There was a reason Stalin and all the leaders of the Eastern Bloc, Kim Jong-il and Un and the Castro, shut down churches to persecute Christians. And we have conflicts today, by the way. So keep praying for Ukraine, but know that their president is no, no friend of the church. Neither is ours. But how is that waging war against the Lord and his anointing? Everything I just said, what's it going to do with the Lord? Remember the words of Jesus when he told Saul on the road to Damascus, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Those who persecute the church persecute Jesus. He takes it personally. But why do they bother? Do they not know what awaits them? Let's get back to our text. Verse 4, we can get to the answer. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Notice this peculiar element of laughter. Nowhere in Scripture do we read of the Lord Jesus laughing in any context. Only here we see it in the Psalms. There is no reference to Jesus laughing at all. But here in the Psalms, and not just here in Psalm 2, but also Psalm 37, verses 12 to 13. But the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he knows their day is coming. Psalm 59. But you laugh at them, Lord. You scoff at those nations. We just want to be sure that sometimes certain passages get stuck with a thing, right? So Jonah, it's always about the big fish. It's more than the fish, right? It's about the Lord. It's about the Lord sending Jonah. This is more than just the Lord laughing. But since we're on the topic, let's explore it. Again, in light of the opening verse in Psalm 1, where we are told that the righteous do not sit in the seat of scoffers, but here we see the righteous judge sits on his throne of judgment, laughing in wrath and fury, scorning the scornful. The Lord gets the last laugh. He laughs at their utter foolishness and their attempts to overthrow him. Yet in all seriousness, if you can just imagine, a, I do, maybe, the Lord's laughing, but then his countenance changes to his serious poker face. As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. The ultimate fulfillment is clearly the new Jerusalem. The day is coming when Jesus will reign from his throne in the new Jerusalem. And whatever your end time view may be, one thing is true. Jesus will reign, and he will have the last laugh. Let's talk about more of that answer, the decree. I will tell the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son today, I have begotten you. And you can see that quoted again in Acts 13, 33 from Paul. Uh, you can see that again in Hebrews 1, 5, where, where the author there is proving and demonstrating how Jesus is greater than the angels, and the rest of the book shows how Jesus is greater than everyone else, Moses, Aaron, Melchizedek even. But here in verse 7, we see this is, this is actually Jesus speaking. The Lord said to me, Yahweh said to me, you are my son. Now, a quick theological point, when we talk about begotten, um, and I'll leave this, we got some, we got some scholars in the house, you got your pastor, or we got some graduates from Knox, well, you can go to them and your elders, or pick up a good book. Begotten here does not mean made, that's the old, old heresy, the Arian heresy back in the early centuries of the church, the, this old bishop Arian said there was a time when Jesus was not. Um, and with the, the church fought through that and demonstrated with scripture that there's something that's eternally begotten. I can't crack that for you. I don't have a schematic on how that works. It just is. It's, behold the mystery, people. Behold the mystery. Eternally begotten. Now, who did this? Someone, when I, I was looking over there, someone came and mixed up my papers. That's what happened. I wasn't even looking. It just happened. I just, I felt a presence, but I didn't want to call it out. But what's being, the portrait here is not lowly Jesus, meek and mild. Not that he's not, but that's not the portrait in this psalm. The picture is not depicting Jesus as the Lamb of God, but rather the lion's whelp, the lion of Judah, the royal tribe whose scepter will not depart from Judah, 
forever on the throne of his father David, as this is displayed in the first chapters of Hebrews, already mentioned, making explicit reference to Psalm 110, in which is built on the Davidic covenant of 2 Samuel 7.14. I give you more details than you may want, but I'm one of those guys that just have to just show you my notes. And you might be interested. But this is Jesus. This is Jesus who is the conquering king who is promised to be coming from Judah through David. Seed of the woman, seed of Abraham, through Judah, on David's throne forever. That's the one we're talking about. He's a conquering king. That scepter, that scepter is the iron rod. You see that in Revelation 227, 125, and 1915. We hear of smashing pots with a, with, a, with a metal rod. Something about that. My, my daughter just told me but there's a thing these days. There's a, a new thing. This like rage, rage room. You go in this room, you just smash things. Get all your frustrations out. I suggest if you get that much rage, take it to the Lord first. Go to the throne. Just unload, unload at Jesus' feet all your rage. Although there is something about just breaking stuff. I get it. I get it. And there's something about, I just imagine a good solid piece of rebar and breaking the clay pots that I always break in my house anyway. Um, I have the finest collection of broken pots at my house. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Verse 8, ask of me, and I, this is the Father speaking to Jesus, ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. The church is a gift from the Father to the Son. But Jesus has to die for it. In our world, what kind of gift is that? Right? How about just the gift, please? Just give me the gift. Yet Jesus has to go through all that he has to go through to pay for these, this heritage of his. And those who will not bend their knee he promises he shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. That's pretty severe. That's a pretty, I mean, there's more. We can read the book of Revelation, right? We got blood, we got death, we got a second death. It all, all kinds of stuff happens over there. It, it's, this is more than G, lowly Jesus, meek and mild. This is our conquering king. Let's get to verse 10. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. In these verses, we're back now to the psalmist speaking. The decree is established and the judgment is sure. With a severe picture of judgment, the psalmist provides word to the wise, to all who are paying attention in Washington, at the UN at every godless country in, on this globe. All who are paying attention, and they are paying attention. They are. They just think they're going to win. To all those who God has put in authority, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Today's a day of salvation for them. If they want it, if, it, if their heart is so inclined, if somehow they are humble enough and contrite enough to bend their knees to the Lord Jesus Christ. There is salvation for them, whoever they are. But if not, their knees will be broken. They're going to bow either way. Every knee will bow. And for those of us here, I, I didn't love the Lord for 20 years of my life. Maybe you too. You had a stubborn heart. You were part of this. You maybe you weren't a world ruler. Probably not. But you had a heart that was hardened against the Lord. And by his grace, our conquering king conquered you. But he restored you. I just we just learned this um, uh, last week about a, a Japanese. I I I. I on Instagram, if you follow me, if I let you follow me, you have to ask permission. And I follow a lot of pottery 
I'm, I'm all about pottery. In, in Japanese, they just do it. Japanese pottery, Korean pottery, uh, they just do it great over there. I always tell folks, Japanese, they, they perfect everything. Is that stereotypical? Whatever. They, they perfect everything. You give them something and they, and they just take it and they, go back and they come back with you and say, is, is this what you meant? <laughs> this, this, is you, this is how you wanted to do it, right? It's like, yeah, you, you did it. Um, I just feel that way about the Japanese. But they really do pottery right. And, and, and there's a, a thing that they have, uh, it's, it's a tradition they have, uh, some pottery tradition where they just take a piece of pottery and they break it and they put it back together with gold. I don't know what you call it. I mean, there's a Japanese name for it. If I even knew it, I'd blow it for you. But I'm just, but somehow that is, and to me, I, I, that's awesome. But I, I just can't help but think then that because we just saw a book just came out from PNR. Remade. What, that's the good English word that I can say. Remade from PNR Publishers. I haven't read the book, but I know the publisher, and they're great people, and they're great books. Buy the book. I haven't even read it. That's my review. It's got a great cover. That's my review. And, a great, and, and, it, and it resembles the pottery uh, that's been broken and put back together and held and bonded together with gold, right? It is a picture, right? That is a picture. That the Lord smashed me. I was just smashing myself anyway. He just did it for me, did a better job, and put me back together, and now... All of us are being daily, momentarily, being conformed to the image of Jesus, being remade. So kiss the sun, what a beautiful picture. Lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. The Lord gets angry pretty quick when it comes to sin. That's what it says right here. His wrath is quickly kindled. He shows patience towards us. There's no doubt about it. But the moment sin entered the world, his wrath is quickly kindled. We serve a terrible God. The old way of using the word terrible, full of terror. He's not bad at it. <laughs> he's great at it. But he's a God of terror. When you're on the losing side, the rebelling losing side, the appropriate response would be to be terrified. We ought to be terrified if we're going to stand on our own with no mediator between us and the Lord. Don't try it. Today's the day of salvation. Well, what I want to do right now, because what's the application? What's it going to do with us? Okay, we the world's horrible. The world hates us. Satan hates us. Jesus wins. What now? Because we live on the timeline between Babel and New Jerusalem. What now? Well, let's take our cues from the, the apostles themselves. I'm going to go to the book of Acts, in chapter 4. And we know in the chapter 4, it's kind of early in the book of Acts, and it's early church history. They've been commissioned by Jesus in Acts chapter 1. We saw that in Matthew 28, of course, with the Great Commission. Here's my tie-in. That's what missionaries got to do. You've got to tie it into missions. But we're always on missions. On mission, amen, that's it. It's just not a certain time of the year we have a missions conference. It's just not something else that we do. We're always on mission. You're on mission right here to Smyrna. In that regard, you're all missionaries. You all need to be ready with the word of God to testify to who Jesus is. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, right? So you're always on mission, right? There you go, thank you. Well, right in the book of Acts, the apostles, they're preaching the gospel, and they're starting to cause a little bit of a commotion. They're starting to get some attention. People coming around. You know, people might even be healed. I don't know, like a lame beggar. He may be healed catches the attentions of the rulers, and the rulers, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and, and they're seeing what's going on, and, and things are happening in the name of Jesus, and they're getting outshined, right? Because now here comes these uneducated fishermen. These guys stink. They probably need a haircut. There's a joke in there somewhere. Um, but what happens is, they, they go, so they go before the Sanhedrin, and they go before the council, Hear that word before? They go before the council. And they're, they're being questioned of why they're doing this and whose name they're doing and all the rest. And they even observe in verse 13, uh, you don't have to go there, but Acts 4.13 says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. Because what do they have? They had a simple message. It's called the gospel. And they're proclaiming Jesus, King of the Jews, King of Kings, rose from the grave, king of the grave, right? He rose from the dead, and this is not the narrative 
that they want to be released. This is not what they want to get out. Uh, ultimately, they were not arrested. Though. They, well, they were arrested, but they were not in prison. They were held, questioned, and then they were let go. And what happens in, in 424? When they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, here's a prayer. Sovereign Lord, you have made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. And through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Wow. And now, Lord, look upon the threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. There's that word again, boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed and the place which they were gathered together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. I hope as we read this, I hope as we look at Psalm 2 again, maybe tonight, tonight when you go home, and just be reminded, just stand bold. The world is against you. It's just not that we're swimming upstream. It is like number five rapids. Is that the big number on rapids? Like number five rapids coming at us continually, and we're trying to get upstream. The world is coming at us continually, all day long. The world is, is continually, laws are being made. We just had a law recently passed in this country, which um, it's an anti-Semitism law. Uh, and in that law, there's issues concerning restraints or punishments for preaching the word of God, actually, if you read the fine print. I can go on about how the world is, right? I can go how, how bad the world is. Really. We did that part already. But here I just want you to, to show you that the bullseye fulfillment is, is right here. Psalm 2 fulfillment has happened right here in their midst. And interesting how the Jews were numbered among the Gentiles because in, in, the, in the verse 24 it says, the translation here is, why did the Gentiles rage? Which is another word for ethnos. I got my Greek there. Someone give great man. The ethnos. By the way, you're all ethnic. Did you know that? Everyone's ethnic. It's not a, a, another people group. The nations. But it says, why did the Gentiles rage? But numbered among the Gentiles, the nations, it says right here in our list that those in Israel were numbered among them as well. That's another, that's a long, fascinating study. But folks, I just want you to be encouraged to know that though the world hates you, though the world is set up against you continually, um, we serve a conquering king. And he is winning. He's taking ground continually. He's taking ground continually, and every time a soul comes into the kingdom, every time someone's life was smashed by the Lord in the best possible way that they could be remade in the image of Christ, the kingdom advances. And, and as we w await to see our blessed hope, Jesus face to face, as he sits on the throne now, and by the way, he's not, probably not sitting, literally. We saw that for, he stood for Stephen, the martyrs, right? Jesus is busy right now, so I don't think he's actually sitting on the throne. Um, but we can argue about that if you want. But I think he's, he's standing at the ready, eager to return. But the day is fixed. He will return. But until then, he dwells among his people. We are the temple, the living stones. Not just in the New Jerusalem someday, not just in the old one where he first landed, but he now resides with his people. He sits enthroned. And let me just end with these words. Let the scripture finish this one out before I keep babbling. Revelation 21, 1 through 8, and I'm going to jump down the passage. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. 
And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all the liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And jumping down to the passage, in closing, and I saw no temples in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine in it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, for there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. By God's grace, that's all of us here today. Let me just close in prayer. Dear Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for your anointed Jesus. We thank you that he indeed was the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He was also the line of Judah. And we are awaiting his return. And we ask that until then, by your Holy Spirit, enable us to be bold. Enable us to continue the work that you've given us through that great commission to make disciples of all nations. It is your commission. It is an impossible commission. We cannot do it on our own strength. Let us not try. So Holy Spirit, enable us to fulfill that which the Lord Jesus has given us to do, that his name would be glorified, and that we will be there the day when all the nations are marched in. And we thank you in his name. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let earth and heavenly saints proclaim the power and might of his great name. Let us exult on bended knee. Praise God the Holy Trinity. Amen. And now hear this benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, in authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>